Coming up on SciTech Now, predator plants of Pennsylvania. And you're going to have plants that are only specifically found in the bog, uh, like the carnivorous plants, the leather leaf, and the sphagnum moss. Our project is Liver Clear. It's a biofilm, just essentially a bacterial membrane that has specific bacteria and microbes in it that can uh, capture and degrade estrogen from your water supply. There's a chip inside that allows me to perceive the light frequencies of color through vibrations in my head. As the vibrations become inner sounds, so I hear the sound of each color. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. Our show begins in the bog, a diverse habitat where you can find plants to eat and plants that do the eating. SciTech producer Bill Hallman takes us for a tour at Black Mashannon State Park. Welcome to Black Mashannon State Park. 3,400 acres of protected land surrounded by another 43,000 acres of state forest. It's about as private as public land gets. When you're here, don't count on cell phone service or Wi-Fi. The tweets and snaps are organic, the science is all natural, and the bog is really worth sharing. A bog is a wetland area, so you're gonna have soils that are going to help hold the water in, low nutrient counts, and you're going to have plants that are only specifically found in the bog, uh, like the carnivorous plants, the leather leaf, and the sphagnum moss. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about the carnivores, but the moss is the main ingredient in this habitat. The sphagnum moss is found all throughout our bog area, and as the rain comes down, as water is filtering into it, it actually can clean out any pollution that may be in the water, so it helps give us good water quality. The water is clean, but it's not very nutritious. The moss absorbs the minerals and replaces them with acids. Not a great environment for plants, unless those plants have another source of nutrition. Black Moshannon is home to three types of carnivorous plants. The pitcher plant, is the easiest to find. That is our pitcher plant colony. There's a few of those scattered throughout our bog area. They grow in very large quantities. As the bugs fly into it and go down inside the pitchers, it's actually producing an enzyme which is going to break down the insect so it's able to get some of its food that way. The pitcher plant is absorbing nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. So does the sundew, but it has a different strategy. The sundew uh, is one of our carnivorous plants and that is going to look like the sun with little rays coming off of it. And the little tiny dew drops on it are actually a type of glue that the plant produces so the insects get stuck to that. And they actually will kind of close around it just a little tiny bit and that is going to break down the insects and get its food. When it comes to the bladder wart, all of the action is happening under the water. Bladderwort is found throughout our lake area. It actually looks like seaweed, and it looks like it has little tiny black seeds on it. Those seeds are actually the bladders, and they have a little tiny trap door on it. So as an insect such as mosquito larvae would swim by it, it triggers that door, and it opens up, and it sucks in the water in the insect and then closes itself around it. The carnivores love the bog, but don't get the wrong impression. This is not a desolate wasteland where all bugs meet their doom. It's an intricate and diverse ecosystem. We have over 80 different kinds of dragonflies and damselflies here. Uh, you can see larger animals such as bear and bobcat like to be in those areas. And it's also providing nice clean water for the fish that like to live in our lake area behind us. It's also one of the only places in Pennsylvania where you can pick wild cranberries. Okay, let's, let's do this. It's pretty sour. It's good. So if you need the day to simplify, why not unplug and relax in one of the most complex environments in central Pennsylvania? An air purifier made of spider webs, a toilet insert that captures estrogen, and a cactus-like water harvester. These are just a few of the projects presented at the first Biodesign Challenge in New York City. 
Science Friday has the story. Civil Momentum is a project that tries to bridge a new type of symbiotic relationship between humans and spiders. So our project is called Liver Clear, and it's a bacterial membrane that will reside in your toilet in order to filter out estrogen. Our project was called Bioesters. If you've ever had seaweed salad before, there's kind of like viscous gel. You know, extract that and kind of concentrate it. That's what we were working with. We are now in a culture where everything's about the pitch. You know, you go to an accelerator and they have a demo day and it's all about sell, sell, sell. We're trying to do something very different. We're saying think, think, think. The three goals of the challenge have been, one, to create a community of scientists, designers, and artists who are all collaborating together. Goal number two has been inform the public about what the potentials of the technology might be. And number three, hey, let's see some fresh ideas in the space of biotechnology. Let's see what we can do. As droughts and desertification are increasing on the planet uh, worldwide um, and existing water sources are rapidly depleting, we do need to look for other sources of water. And the uh, various members of the Apuncha genus actually have this great ability to collect water from fog with specially designed spines. So what we did is took inspiration from these cacti to create uh, synthetic panels that can basically do the same thing. Just by like delving into the body of research that's out there, we found this biopolymer alginate and started experimenting with it, kept learning more and more and more. And we eventually came up with this fiber that we extruded out of a syringe and actually had some strength to it. Fibers are kind of what make the uh, textile industry run. And rather than you know growing it in forms, we can extrude it and use any existing knitting machine to fabricate the product that we're looking to make. There's a type of spider fiber that has a glue component to it and it's been identified that that glue not only catches prey but it also catches microparticles and pollen and other things that are in there, basically anything that's charged. So our project takes the, these natural spider web fibers and use them as an air filtering system. In our design, you don't really wear the spider. We kind of have the spider here as a provocative statement of what it could be. What we're proposing is to create a good environment for spiders to live in so that they would be happy, produce webs, and then we could use the webs. There would be a disc kind of shape that would have webs in the middle, and you wear it as you would wear a mask. Our project is Liver Clear. It's a biofilm, which is essentially a bacterial membrane that has specific bacteria and microbes in it that can uh, capture and degrade estrogen from your water supply. Suddenly there's so many female fish in the rivers and they couldn't reproduce anymore and that's where we kind of stemmed from with this, this estrogen idea. The idea is that it kind of tapers off towards the, the normal hole in your toilet and the estrogen will get trapped in this membrane here. But the water can still go through the honeycomb structure so your toilet will function normally. And there is also an idea of having an, an indicator saying, okay, this is coming out of your body. Donald Trump's face will appear in your toilet. I think the judges were excited to see that the students, even though they were art and design students, actually delved into the science. To be perfectly frank, it's not ready for showtime, but that they had made the material, that they had thought about how it might work, how it's different from materials that are already out there. I think they were excited that the students had explored context. It's one of the biggest and most complex questions out there. Are we alone in the universe? The field of astrobiology studies the origin, viability, and future of life on other planets and asks, is planet Earth really as unique as we think? Joining me now is Caleb Scharf, Director of Astrobiology at Columbia University. I'm sure you have the answer to this question, are we alone, right? But this is kind of a question that we've always wondered as soon as we had the capacity to wonder. Um, and then when we were able to look at that beautiful image of the blue planet for the first time, and then we started looking around and seeing a kajillion of these, how many other blue ones are there? How do we tackle that? It's a great question. And I should say, we don't know whether there's anything else out there, which is a fascinating puzzle because, as you mentioned, we're at this point in our history where we've now discovered that there are other worlds around other stars. And 20 years ago, we didn't know. 
if that was the case. And we suspected that there were probably planets around other stars, but we didn't know if it happened very often. We now know that it happens very often. Essentially, every star that you see in the sky has a planetary system around it. Mm -hmm. And something like at least 15% of those planetary systems have worlds that could be other blue marbles, uh, like the famous picture that you're mm -hmm. evoking. And so the big question now is, do any of them harbor life? And that's a, that's a big focus for, for science right now. But it is also this fundamental ancient question that we've asked for a, a very long time. We have this kind of Goldilocks just far enough away from the sun, not too far. Uh, there's so many things that had to go just right for the preconditions of life here. But what's to say four billion years ago that combination didn't repeat, considering that there's a kajillion different planets and galaxies and solar systems? Again, it's, it's a great question, and it's really at the forefront of inquiry at the moment, is how robust is this phenomenon that we call life? What does it take to get it going, and what does it take to sustain it across four billion years? I mean, we tend to forget this. We've, we, or life on Earth, has been here for something like four billion years, and it's gone through many changes, and it's gone through many different environmental conditions. So the, on the one hand, it looks like life is pretty robust. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we still don't know what the, the key pieces are for the origin of life or the sustaining of life over time scales like that. So it's, it's still a central puzzle. What are the factors that point to the possibility of this happening? Is it just the sheer number of it? I mean, that the mathematical probability of one in a billion, not so much if you have 50 billion. That's right. Well, that, that is our intuition. Right. And it may well turn out to be absolutely correct that scattered amongst the stars we see in the sky, there's lots of other life. Uh, but the truth is, we simply don't know. And it, it's very interesting because it's to do with the way in which we make inferences on the basis of very little data. So I like to say that astrobiology is a field that has one data point, uh, which is us. And we can extrapolate from that, but it turns out to be really difficult. You can't do much with one data point. And so we're in this kind of interesting point of tension where everything is saying, Surely there's got to be life out there. There has to be other life, and it may be abundant, but we still don't quite know. We haven't crossed that next threshold. Given the tools that we have today, how does science study the viability of life elsewhere? I mean, we have one or two really great telescopes up in the sky, but you know, there's lots of interpolation that has to happen based on how light is traveling to us, what sorts of gases that we see, and then really just to try to get down to that minuscule level and say, is that planet viable? Mm. So with our telescopes, we're trying to probe the chemistry of distant planets, and again, that's very difficult, and it's right at the forefront of current inquiry. And in the future, we're, we're aiming to do better than just look for oxygen. We're aiming to look at a whole host of different chemicals that might exist in a planetary atmosphere, for example, that give away the presence of a biosphere. Now, of course, the really interesting thing will be if we get some of that data and we say, hey, this planet has oxygen, maybe it's got methane in the atmosphere, what do we do next? How do we convince ourselves that there's life there. That, I think, is a, a puzzle we've yet to, to tackle. Even if, best case scenario, we say that it looks like there are signs of life on some distant planet, one, we're not necessarily, we don't have the technology yet to be able to travel anywhere close to that because a telescope might be able to see light years out, right? But we're never yeah. going to be able to travel that. And then two, life there might not have evolved the same way that life here evolved. There's so many wonderful puzzles in this field. We look at our surroundings and go, wow, this is just perfect for us. Right. But in truth, we came out of those circumstances, and so it's only natural that they will seem to work well for us. Uh, but this question of could it have happened differently, and you'd still, after four billion years, arrive at thinking supposedly intelligent organisms like us, mm. also something we want to try to understand much, much better, because it's deeply linked to questions of uh, you know, chance and chaos in the universe. It's linked to the fundamentals of evolution. How does evolution work on these very long timescales? What are the possible trajectories that you can take and still end up at the, roughly the same place. Uh, so the marvelous thing about astrobiology as a science is, although you were asking questions about life elsewhere in the universe, ultimately it comes back 
to answer our deepest questions about ourselves, I think. You've got a very cool job. Director of Astrobiology at Columbia University, Caleb Sharp. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. In my lab, we measure uh, the human brain, uh, which is, of course, incredibly exciting and interesting, but very hard to measure. Uh, so we do that in a number of ways. We use um, functional imaging. It's called functional magnetic resonance imaging to image the human brain um, while it's engaged in uh, cognition, in thought, in memory formation. The way we test human subjects is by taking our very uh, big questions about memory and behavior, reducing them to something as simple and specific as possible, and implementing that question in the form of basically a computer game. And now we ask people to play this computer game while their brain is being scanned, and that way we can track what's happening in their brain and where as they're engaged in a particular aspect of learning or memory. What we actually measure with fMRI are changes in metabolism, in oxygenation in the brain, and those images that we see after processing show us where in the brain were, was an area where there was more metabolism and more activity under a certain condition. So for example, where there's more activity when you remember something relative to when you don't remember something. A cyborg is a human whose body is enhanced by robotics. At one point, it was something you would only find in science fiction. But in today's Hangout, reporter Andrea Vasquez speaks to a man who considers himself a cyborg and co-founded an organization dedicated to defending cyborg rights. And joining me via Skype is Neil Harbison. Neil, thanks for being with us. Thank you. How did you become a cyborg? Uh, how did you even get the idea to approach your colorblindness in this way? Well, my aim was to perceive color without changing my sight, because to me, seeing in grayscale has many advantages, because I see better at night. Also, I see better distances. I memorize shapes more easily. So not seeing color was an advantage for me. So I wanted a new sense to perceive color that wouldn't modify my sight or my hearing or my any of my other senses. So the aim was to create a new sense for color. And for doing that, I needed also a new sensory organ. So uh, in the end, I designed an antenna that goes inside my head and then a doctor drilled the head and then there's a chip inside that allows me to perceive the light frequencies of color through vibrations in my head. So then I memorize the vibrations for each color and then I can sense color through this new sense, which actually allows me to also hear color because the vibrations in the head become inner sounds. So I hear the sound of each color. And also it allows me to go beyond the visual spectrum because it also includes infrareds and ultraviolets and also internet perception. So internet that allows me to receive colors from other devices or other people that can send colors to my head. Can you show us how it's kind of connected and where it goes? So this is an antenna that picks up the light frequencies in front of me, and then it goes at the back at the occipital bone, and then there's four implants at the back, one for the chip that vibrates depending on the light frequency in front, two other implants are to hold this structure, and the fourth implant is internet connection so people can send colors to my head, or I can also connect to satellites so that I can then sense the colors from space. So people can send colors to your head? They can send colors any time of the day or night. So if there's a beautiful sunset in Australia now, my friend from Melbourne can actually stream live images from the mobile phone to my head, and then I suddenly sense the colors of a sunset. Or if someone sends colors at night and, and I wake up and I realize that my dream was very violet, then it's probably because someone was sending violet colors at night. And do you find that things that people say look beautiful tend to also sound beautiful to you? Uh, not always, no. Like sunsets sound a bit sad because it's like a descending note. So it sounds like a bit sad, whereas um, supermarkets sound much more exciting. I like the sound of supermarkets much more than the sound of a sunset. You're hearing a whole spectrum of noises beyond what we're even seeing. Do you feel it there constantly? Do you forget it's there? Do you shower and sleep with it? Yeah, there's two things. One is the sense. The new sense is completely integrated with my brain. So the the software and the brain uh, feel like one. So that's one union. And the other union is the union between the body part and my head. It's just like any other body part. And yes, it's waterproof, so I can 
shower and it's I just had to get used to the new height uh, <laughs> and also the fact that people uh, are not used to seeing uh, humans with antennas but I think in the 2020s we might see more people with new body parts and it will become normal to meet people with new sensory organs. And you and co-founder Moon Rivas from the Cyborg Foundation, you guys have really sort of spearheaded this effort. So what is the motivation here in promoting cyborgism? Is it about fixing things? Is it about enhancing and pushing the boundaries of human capability? It's about extending our perception of reality. We are, I guess, the first generation that can actually design how we want to perceive life in a very profound way. We can design um, new senses, we can design new body parts, and we can design our perception of reality. So we see this as an art, cyborg art, and also something that can change uh, our species. I've read about something called North Sense, which is one of these extensions, and read an explanation that it can add to your memories in the sense of you remember where you were, maybe what you were wearing, what you were hearing when something happened, and then now this added layer of which cardinal direction you were pointing. What are some of the other senses that we can add to our experiences? Yeah, this, the North Sense is now, uh, people are buying it at the Cyborg Nest, and it's, it's something that will allow you to feel the magnetic north of our planet, and this will change the way we sense orientation, it will gain the way we perceive our context, and also it's a sense that other species have sharks and, and um, some birds can have feel the magnetic north, and this helps them orientate. But there's, there's many other senses, like um, feeling um, what's behind you, that's retroception. All of our senses are focused be in, in front of us, but if you have a small sensor that allows you to feel vibrations at the back, like the sensors that we give to cars, it will give you a sense of presence behind you. Also uh, sensing uh, ultrasounds or infrasounds or ultraviolets and infrareds like the antenna, or also something very simple like magnetoception, feeling um, the magnets around us. So it's, it's just extending a bit more the senses that we have or adding completely new senses like the seismic sense that Moon has. She can feel all the earthquakes of the world uh, by an, an implant in her arm that allows her to feel the vibrations of the planet. So she feels a strong connection with the earth because whenever the earth shakes, she shakes. So she feels like she has like two heartbeats, earth beat and her own beat. And part of the human experience is that our brains, without us realizing, are ignoring a certain amount of stimuli as we go through our day. It would be too distracting for us to do what we needed to do if we were hearing everything. Is there any kind of concern that we could end up overstimulating ourselves if we start adding all these senses? At the beginning, it might be a bit more predominant. Having a new sense will dominate uh, your daily life. But then after some months, this sense will integrate with the other senses and it will become normal to have uh, this new sense. So how do you see this cyborgism expanding uh, in the population and the other side of it, the cyborg rights that you and Moon have been pushing for? Yeah, the cyborg rights is having the right to have surgery is one of the main points because some of these cyborg surgeries are still not bioethically uh, allowed. The aim is that these surgeries should be um, allowed and they should be ethically approved by the bioethic committees. So that's one of the basic cyborg rights, the right that we should all have to extend our senses and our perception of reality. And I think we'll be seeing this in the 2020s, that uh, the union between humans and technology will not only be psychological union, it will be a biological union, and many people will merge their bodies with technology in order to have permanent new sensory organs and new senses. It's a whole new world. Neil Harbison, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. For the latest in science, technology, and innovation, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.